Dear Father in Heaven, as we explore this um, detailed topic, we pray for clarity from your Holy Spirit and insight into your Word. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So today's topic is a bit of a detailed topic, and a lot of it is based on information that was from some of the previous talks. So if I, if I recover everything, we'll be here all day. So um, there might be some things that I don't remember that. If that's the case, feel free to ask me. I say afterward, but not immediately afterward because I've got to run up to the sound booth. But, um, but yeah, feel free to or message me. You all have my phone because I've been texting you guys. So today we're looking at the topic of the coming crisis also known as the topic of the mark of the beast, one that people get real excited about, and a lot of theories about it. And um, before we get into it, I just want to say, anytime we study, it's one thing when we study prophecy and we see how God has predicted things and we can see how he's fulfilled them, like the one in the 2300-year prophecy, those we can have great confidence in. We can say, this is it. When we're studying prophecy that isn't yet fulfilled, we can have good confidence in it, but we need to hold it with somewhat of a loose hand with the understanding that God's people traditionally, historically, have not fully understood future prophecy until after it's fulfilled. For instance, they thought Jesus was coming to be a ruler that would kick the Romans out, right? Um, There's one exception in 70 AD when Rome came and surrounded Jerusalem. The Christians recognized that as a fulfillment of a prophecy that Jesus gave in Matthew chapter 24, and they all got out. And so no Christians were killed in that horrible siege and later um, massacre. Uh, But that's the only time that I can think in history in which God's people have perfectly understood every prophecy. So we're going to look into this future prophecy, but we'll hold it with an open hand saying we're going to allow God to be God And if we make a few mistakes, okay, right? Fair enough? All right, so let's start by addressing the key players in the Mark of the Beast situation. And this stuff is, this stuff is past, so this is pretty solid. Um, Daniel chapter 7 is is one of our key passages for understanding prophecy. So in in apocalyptic prophecy, which is what we find in Daniel and Revelation, you have symbols and there's two ways to discover what those symbols mean. The most common way is to think, huh, I wonder what this could represent. That's done a lot. But then if you think it represents one thing and you think it represents something else, then what do you mean, right? So the other way, the way that we go with, is that you look for that, Bible, that symbol to be explained elsewhere in the Bible. And so a beast is a major part of of apocalyptic prophecy. And in Daniel 7, verse 17, it says, those great beasts, which are four, are four kings which will arise out of the earth. We'll see some pictures of those in just a little bit. Verse 23 says the same thing. The fourth beast shall be a fourth kingdom on the earth. And so we, we understand that this idea of a beast is a king or a kingdom. It is a power, a political power on the earth. And so it's pretty easy, once you have that, that picture, you can look, okay, here comes a beast. We know it's a kingdom. Now, what are the characteristics of that kingdom? So going into the, the idea of the mark of the beast, Revelation chapter 14, verses 9 and 10, this is the third angel's message, and it has the, this idea of the mark of the beast. Then a third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, if anyone worships the beast in his image and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, that will come in important. He himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. Now, why does it say he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God? Because the wine of the wrath of God is not intended for humans. Right? God did not set out to be angry with and destroy people. He is destroying the beast. He's destroying the dragon, which represents Satan. That's uh, Revelation 12, 
verse uh, 7 through 9. Um, he's destroying evil, sin. Those are the things that he's wrathful for, against. Those who receive the mark of the beast on their forehead or on their hand are aligning themselves with those things that are under the wrath of God. And if you align yourself with those things, you will be destroyed with them. But the destruction, the wrath of God was never intended to be for people. It is those people who put themselves in the path of destruction are the ones who will receive it. Okay, so as we look at, as we look at this idea of the beast, so there's two beasts in Revelation 13 we're going to look at. And there's four beasts in, Revel- in Daniel chapter 7. We're not going to spend much time on Daniel 7. Uh, D covered that in a previous lesson. But in Daniel 7, he sees this vision. There's a lion with eagle's wings. Do you remember what country that, that represented? Babylon. Babylon. The next one was a bear that's raised up on one side, had three ribs in its mouth. That one represents Medo-Persia. And then you have the leopard with four heads and four wings, representing the very rapid conquering of the Greeks. Then you have this other beast that just says it's terrible. It doesn't connect it to any other animal that, that we know of. It's just a terrible beast. It's got iron claws, or iron teeth and claws. It's got ten horns, and then three of those ten horns are plucked out, and a notable horn comes up in the middle. So that's your, your biblical outline of, of nations, of, of kingdom states coming into um, throughout time. From Daniel's time in Babylon all the way down to Jesus' time and even beyond with this little horn power that goes into the 1260 years um, into that time after Jesus died. Now we go to Revelation chapter 13. Revelation 13 and verse uh, 1 and 2. Let's look at this beast. It says, And I... Then I stood on the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rising up out of the sea. Now, all of those beasts in Daniel 7 also rose up out of the sea. Having seven heads and ten horns. So we've got a connection with this beast here. And on his horns, ten crowns, and on his heads, a blasphemous name. So he's blaspheming. Now, the beast that I saw was like a leopard. His feet were like the feet of a bear, and his mouth was like the mouth of a lion. And who gave him his power, seat, and great authority? The dragon. The dragon dragon is Satan. So the dragon gave him his power, his throne, and great authority. So we see this beast is a reflection of these beasts, but it's backward. The description is backward. So Daniel sees these kingdoms as the future, John is looking back at them from the, from the present back to the past. But it's the same, we see the similar characteristics here. And back when, um, back when D did the one on, on bad religion, he looked at, at this power here, this little horn power and this beast, and he found, and we found that it was, this referred to the church of the Middle Ages. Nowadays, it's called the papacy or the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, although I will has, uh, hasten to mention that this is the Roman Catholic Church as it exists today is not the same as it was back then. It doesn't have the persecuting power. A lot of the beliefs are the same, but what I've found is most Catholics don't even know what their church teaches. And by the way, there's Adventists who don't know what their church teaches too. There's probably um, people from Church of Christ. You know, there's people who they just grew up that way. But when I was in New Mexico, which is a very heavily Catholic state, when we would preach Bible prophecy and we would show these things that they teach, the Catholics would be like, oh, I don't believe that. Mm-hmm. Right? So just because you're a Catholic doesn't mean you're bad. It's a system. It's a system of beliefs that's the, that's the challenge. But the Bible still connects these things. And you've got the, in Revelation chapter 17, you have this woman who's riding on a beast on many waters. These waters representing lots and lots of people, it says. It just, it just tells us that. That's another one of those keys. And so um, we find this religious political state that arose 
back in back in the sixth century um, A.D. or f- I get confused the 500s. Yeah, I get confused on whether you go back or forward one when you say which century it is. So I think it's forward because we're in the 21st century. So it'd be a 6th century uh, BC. So this beast is a blending of these various other powers and there's a blending of the church and state. And um, during that 1260 year period, did we talk about the, 12, the time, times, half time, 1260 years? Okay. I thought so. Um, during that time, we find that the, the church, and it was the church, it was really the only visible Christian church that was available, the church was running the government, persecuting anybody who disagreed with them, and, and so on. They had, a lot, they had a lot of political and religious authority. And notice it says that the dragon gave him his power, his seat, and great authority. The dragon, Satan, operates from a perspective of force, coercion, and deception. And that's how the church operated at that point. You had to follow them. They would coerce you. They would deceive you. They, they kept the Bibles away from you so that you had to just trust what the priests had to say. And even the priests had to trust what their bishops had to say because a lot of the priests didn't even know this stuff. And so that's not God's government. God's government is never one of force. It's one of, of reason and, and trying to help you to understand. So, a little bit of history. In 538, there was, in, the, in, in, about, in, in, in and around the years, about 530 to 550, there was this battle between the Romans, the Roman church, and the Ostrogoths. They were the third of these that were plucked out. They were the last ones to be plucked out. And they held on for a while. They kept fighting back and forth. At, at one point, they were able to go into Rome, sack Rome, take it over, and they imposed a pope in Rome called Silverinus. Pope Silverinus. And I don't know if he was a Goth himself, but he was loyal to the Goths. Then, Belisarius, the general, the Roman general, managed to push them out of Rome whereupon the Goths surrounded Rome and besieged them. In, during that time, the emperor, Justinian, who was operating out of Constantinople at, at the time, he came up with the Justinian Code. And basically, to summarize that, it's basically saying that we are go- now going to become a Christian nation. The Pope is the head of the church and is the head of the state, and it puts all of that authority, all that power, into the Pope. Before that, there was a separation. The Pope was already starting to become corrupt and, and have a lot of falsehoods, but, he was, but there was still Rome in, in Constantinople and the Bishop of Rome in Rome. And so there, there was still a separation. So Justinian, who thought of himself as a theologian, as more than an emperor, he wanted to turn this into a theocracy. So he came up with this Justinian Code, but there was a problem with that. The Goths were preventing him from, having, from making this influence, from making this actually happen. So when his general, Belisarius, comes and kicks the Goths out, he, one of the first things he does is he exiles Pope Silverinus, and he imposes Pope Villaginus, or Villa... V-I-L-I-I-U-S, uh, V-I-G-I-L-I-S, Villagius, or something like that, Villagius. Tough name for me to say. He imposes this guy who was, a, who was a loyalist to the Justinian Code. Like, he was 100% on that. He was ready to rule. He was ready to take that authority. But it didn't do much good because Rome was besieged, and so they couldn't get any of their influence out. So you've got this little... Pope that's doing his thing or trying to do his thing, and that happened in 537. In 538, they managed to break the siege and send the Goths away. At that point, then Villagius, if I'm saying that right, was able to take on that authority and power. And even though the Goths came back a few more times, 
they were never able to break the Pope's authority after that. So from the year 538 until the year 1798, you had this political religious state where regardless of who the political power was, it might be this king here, it might be that king here, and you know, Germany, the region of Germany had theirs, and the region of France had theirs, and so on. You had this overarching religious authority that, was, that everybody was giving fealty to. And then, the Bible tells us, this first beast here, it says, I saw one of its heads as if it had been mortally wounded, and his deadly wound was healed. And all the world marveled and followed the beast. So they worshiped the dragon who gave authority to the beast. And they worshiped the beast saying, who is like the beast who is able to make war with him? So one of the, wounds is, one of the heads is wounded mortally. In 1798, Napoleon sent his general, Berthier, into the Vatican. And he took the Pope and exiled him. So this 1260 years begins with the exile of a Pope and it ends with an exile of a Pope. In both cases, that exile was a change of political power. So after, after this deadly wound happened, the Pope no longer had political power over Europe. But it says that, that oh, and before I get to this part, there are, there are all sorts of contemporary articles for when that happened saying the, the Roman Catholic Church has been dealt a deadly blow. It's been killed. It's over. But of course it wasn't. And it says the deadly wound would be healed. And we know that that has taken place through, through many years. You know, when the, when the American country was founded, there was a strong anti-Catholic bent because it was during this time um, when the deadly wound was given. And, and right around that time, it, there was this anti-Catholic bent. But through time, the, the healing has happened progressively. Um, here is the Pope addressing a joint session of Congress in 2015. And I don't know if you recognize, but here, this is John Boehner. He, at the time, was the Speaker of the House. He was a Roman Catholic. This is Joe Biden. At the time, he was Vice President, which means he was the head of the Senate. He's a Roman Catholic. And there's Pope Francis there addressing the, the combined the joint meeting of Congress. Not many people get to speak to a joint Congress meeting, right? That's the State of the Union address is the only regular one that they do, but they pulled this out just for this event, for this guy. Just 60 years before when John F. Kennedy was elected, there were a lot of people terrified because he was a Catholic and they thought, oh, the Pope's going to run, run the country. And then he was assassinated. I don't know if that's why he was assassinated, but that was, that was a big concern on a lot of people's mind. And now... They're welcoming him. Hey, come address us. And there's everybody, Republicans and Democrats alike, giving a standing ovation. Um, looks like this guy's sitting. But that's about the only one sitting. And he's still clapping. <laughs> then a couple days later, he went and addressed the UN as well. And the Vatican City is considered a non-member state of the UN. They have permanent observer mission. And, you know, one of the big leaps forward for this wound to be healed was when Pope John Paul II worked with uh, Ronald Reagan to get rid of the Soviet Union. So you had the papal authority backed by the power of the American government, and they succeeded to get rid of the Soviet Union. There's another picture of them in the UN. So I saw one of his wounds as if it was deadly, he, deadly wounds, and the wound was healed. And all the world marveled and followed the beast. So they worshipped the dragon who gave authority to the beast, and they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast? Who is able to make war with him? You notice that W word in there. The word worship becomes very essential throughout Revelation 13. They marvel after it, and then they start worshipping. But notice they say they dra worship the dragon who gave authority to the beast. And they worship the beast, saying, who is like the beast? So they're, they're worshiping the dragon, but they don't know that they're worshiping the dragon. They're not saying, oh yeah, I'm going to worship Satan. Because what they're saying is, who is like the beast? 
So it's like it's like it's like the the devil put out a little he puts out a little um, facade and everybody's into that. They don't know who's behind it, so they're just following the beast, worshiping that. But by worshiping that, they're also worshiping the dragon. And so we find this idea that after the deadly wound is healed, or when it's healed, which is then sometime after it was given, there would be, all the world would become impressed with and worshiping this beast. And it would, it would take worldwide sway over the world. Now, there are a lot of people who think that the mark of the beast is some sort of physical thing that can be forced on you. I don't know if you've ever seen a movie or read a book where they're in time fiction and the Christians are trying to hide out because the government's trying to catch them. And if they can catch them and stamp this tattoo on them or a barcode or a computer chip, depending on which era the thing's written in, then they're lost. Is our salvation based on how fast we can run and how good we can hide? No, it's not. Right? So we know that a, that a primary tactic of Satan is he deceives the whole world, right? The devil, the dragon, is there to deceive the world. Jesus said, you're a liar and a father of it. The, the Satan was a liar and the father of lies, right? So this mark of the beast is more of a mark of deception rather than slow speed. So it has to be something more than something that can be imposed on you without your will. Otherwise, Essentially, God would be saying salvation is not based on your choice. It's based on somebody else's choice. So, let's move on to the second beast. Revelation 13 and verse 11 talks about the second beast. Then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb and spoke like a dragon. Now, the second beast comes up the first beast and the beast in Daniel 7 all come up out of the water. This is coming up out of a different sort of place. It's, um, if, if the waters represent spiritual confusion and, and many people and many ideas and all that, as it says in, in um, Revelation 17, the land, the earth would be something different from that. It has two horns like a lamb. So the only animal, tech, animal description that it's given is that of horns like a lamb. And it speaks like a dragon. So horns represent power throughout the Bible. Um, David talks about lifting up the horn of my salvation, right? And then you have your ten horns, which represent ten kings in Daniel 7. And um, so the power of this new beast, this new nation, is like a lamb. Now, who can tell me what the lamb represents throughout the book of Revelation? Jesus, yeah. Um, There's no exception to that. The lamb always represents Jesus in the book of Revelation. And so... um, And so these horns are Christ-like. It's interesting because by the time this, by by this time, the beast, even though it has the name Christian, right, it it represents a Christian church, it's completely represented by a beast. It's not represented in Christian terms at all by this time. But this one does have this Christian form. And we know, um, so we know this one comes up, this, this beast comes up after the deadly wound or after the, the first beast, and right around the time of the deadly wound, we know that it has Christian-like values as its leadership. We know that it speaks like a dragon. And um, I had fun making that one. Of course, we know the dragon speaks in very selfish, self-elevating, blasphemous sort of ways, right? So... If we look for a nation that arises at that same time from a totally different area with Christian principles, like a Christian facade, the only one that would fit that would be the United States. There's no other nation that rose 
to prominence during that time. And we were founded as a Christian nation, but not as a theocracy. And we have this, there's this debate, were we a Christian nation or were we a secular nation? Well, the answer is both. Right? We were based on Christian values, but we were not to have a king or a pope. Right? There's two, two Christian values we had. No king, no pope. Religious freedom and political freedom were the basis of what we were supposed to have. And for many years, the, America did actually promote and spread the world with Christianity. We sent out missionaries. A huge portion of the world has heard about Christ because of American missionaries that went out. Also, we spread things like freedom, capitalism. Billions of people literally have been raised out of poverty as a result of that. But our nation has not been perfect, and we've, we've had a, a transition. And I don't know if you want to give like a specific date for when the transition began. I think it'd be hard to say that. But I've noticed in my lifetime a big difference between how we react, how we act as a nation. And, you know, we speak through our laws, we speak through our military, we speak through our media. You know, one of the reasons why these extremist Islamic groups are able to take hold in places is because we put our media out, and our media is filled with immorality, violence, all those sort of things. They can say, see, that's a Christian nation, right? Because we, we're still seen as the, in, around the world as a Christian nation, and yet we're speaking like a dragon, and so people don't want Christianity. That's how the Islamists are able to say, we've got to keep the West out, because look what Christianity brings. That's why, by the way, when Seventh-day Adventists go into Islamic countries to do mission work, we don't say we're Christians. We say we're Seventh-day Adventists because they're so poisoned by the concept of Christianity because of America being a supposedly Christian nation and then not acting so that they won't listen to you if you say they're, you're Christian. But they don't know what a Seventh-day Adventist is. And so we've got a clean slate. We can go and say, we're Seventh-day Adventists. In your book... The Quran, it talks about Jesus. Let's tell you more about Jesus. And we've been able to reach a lot of Muslims that way who pray five times a day to Jesus now and have mosques instead of churches, but they're worshiping Jesus. And they never call themselves a Christian because we've spoken so effectively like a dragon as a country that that's just, that name is poisoned. And of course, the name Christianity didn't exist at the beginning, it came in later, so like there's there's nothing wrong with not using the name. Yeah, Don. Well, they even refer to us as the people of the book. Yeah, they'll say, oh, yeah, those are the people of the book. Yep. So we see this this idea of of America. Now, this this concept that America would speak like a dragon, and what it's about to say it's going to do. When I was a kid and first heard this in church. And then when I was younger and started studying it in school, I thought, wow, it's hard to believe that would actually happen. I don't find very many people find it hard to believe anymore because we've had such a transition in the last, say, 15 years, 15, 20 years. Um, notice this is going back to Revelation chapter 12 to look at some of the characteristics of the dragon. It says the dragon was enraged with the woman who we, we identified before as God's people, and went to make war with the rest of her offspring, who do what? They keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. So this, this dragon, who's giving his authority, who's the one who's empowering these beasts, is at war with people who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. That's what he's against. That's what makes him really angry. And we find, and so if all the world is marveling after the beast and worshiping the dragon who gives authority to the beast and, and saying, who can, who can make war with this dragon or with this beast? What are they doing? What, what is the thing that this dragon is trying to accomplish or the beast is trying to accomplish for the dragon? It has to do with worship. It has to do with Persecuting those who keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus, the testimony of Jesus. 
And he will cause all on the earth to worship him, whose names have not been written in the book of the life of the Lamb slain for the foundation of the world. Satan has always been after worship. He tried to get Jesus to worship him, right? He said, if you'll just bow down and worship me, I'll give you all these kingdoms. Jesus responded with, it is written. So I'm going to stick with what the Bible says, regardless of what you promised me. And in these end times, this beast is causing everyone on the earth to worship the beast, which is the same as worshiping the dragon, unless they're spirit-filled believers in Jesus. Their name is written in the book of life of the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. That's the first beast. Here's the second beast. And he, the second beast, the lamb beast, exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence. So he's able to do all these first things that the first one did. And he causes the earth and those who dwell in it to do what? To worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. And he was granted power, this is verse 15, he was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast. So in between there, and we shouldn't have pulled that one out, but it says that he makes an image, the second beast makes an image to the first beast. So he's granted power to give breath to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. So worship is an essential factor in the final crisis. When we're talking about the mark of the beast, it has to do with worship over and over. Satan is looking for worship. He's always wanted worship. And now he's finally accomplishing this to some degree. Now an image is not the actual thing. It's the likeness of the thing. So a lot of times when people find out that this first beast is the Roman Catholic papacy, they start obsessing over whatever the Pope is doing. But notice at the end, it's not just what the first beast is doing, it's this image of it. It's something that's like it. It's doing the same things um, as, the, as the first beast, but it's not exactly the same thing. It, is, it isn't the first beast, it's just an image of it. And I'm afraid that a lot of Bible sco- uh, students are so focused on the first beast that if the second beast starts acting like that, they'll go right along because it's not the Catholics doing it. So, and you see this, a lot of Christians really support government stepping in and mandating Christian values. Now, I'm all for Christian values, but does God work based off of coercion and force? Or does he work off of, here's the truth, trust me and follow it? And so a lot of Christians are pulled in because now if, the, if the Catholic Church were, were doing it, well, they maybe not, wouldn't go along with it, but it's not the Catholics doing it. It's the Protestants, and we're Protestants. Um, but it's using the same techniques as the first beast. All right, um, verse 16, this is the second beast. He causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads, and that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. If you can't buy or sell in our economy, that's going to be a problem, right? How many of us could live right now? If you suddenly could not buy or sell anything, how many of us, barring the miracle of God, could live very long? Even if you grow a garden, is it enough to completely feed you. And plus, the water that you water your garden with is controlled by the power company, so your power is going to get cut off, and your water is going to get cut off. Even if you have a well, you still probably are running power. And so we're very dependent on being able to buy and sell, which is why that is such an effective way of getting people to receive this mark. In Daniel 20... um, 7 verse 25, we're going to start now looking at what this mark represents. This, this beast, this little horn power, which is the same as the Revelation beast, says he shall intend to change times and laws. Notice it says he will intend. He can't actually change God's times and laws, right? But he tries. So what is the mark of, this, of the beast? The first beast, that mark, they say what their mark is. The mark of their authority. Here's the Catholic Encyclopedia. The church, after changing the day of rest from the Jewish Sabbath, 
of the seventh day of the week to the made the third commandment refer to Sunday as the day to be kept as holy as the Lord's day. They squished the first and second commandment into one, making the, the what we would call the fourth commandment the third. So they're saying we made the change, which is true, they did. Here's from the Converts Catechism of Catholic Doctrine. I have this little book in my office. Uh, question, which is the Sabbath day? Answer, Saturday is the Sabbath day. Question, why do we observe Sunday instead of Saturday? Answer, we observe Sunday instead of Saturday because the Catholic Church and the Council of Laodicea transferred the solemnity from Saturday to Sunday. Like, we did that. We're going to change. We changed this time. We changed this law. We did it. Yeah. That's absolutely true. My first day of class, first grade, my catechism was exactly that. I had no idea. So Don's saying that in his first catechism class in first grade, because you were raised Catholic, you had to memorize this thing right here. So now they have gotten a little bit, like they don't publish stuff this obvious anymore because we've been talking about it. And so the latest catechism that I have was they just sent to me. I don't know why. I just got it in the mail. Here's this, maybe they're like, yeah, we want you to teach this one. not. But anyway, it doesn't say that. It says that they keep Sunday instead of Saturday because of the resurrection. Um, but this has been their, their official teaching for many, many years. Uh, here's Catholic record. Deny the authority of the Catholic, of the church, and you have, to, you have no adequate or reasonable explanation or justification for the substitution of Sunday for Saturday in the third or Protestant fourth commandment of God. The church is above the Bible, and this transference of Sabbath observance is proof of that fact. So they're saying the reason, the fact that all churches, Protestant or not, worship on Sunday is proof that they're above the Bible and they can make that change. Because even when the reformers broke off and they said, we're not going to pray to the, the priests, we're not going to respect the Pope, they still respected the change of the Sabbath to Sunday. Um, this is Cardinal Gibbons, or actually it's the Chancellor of Car Cardinal Gibbons. He says, of course the Catholic Church claims that the change was her act. The act is a mark of her ecclesiastical power and authority in religious matters. What's our mark of authority? We are able to do this. I don't have this quote in there, but there's another quote that's kind of funny. that said, Protestants keeping Sunday is like a little boy running away from his mother, but keeping a locket of her hair in his, in his bag. Um, here's one, Canon Cafeteria, the Catechism explained. The Sabbath was Saturday, not Sunday. The church altered the observance of the Sabbath to the observance of Sunday. Protestants must be rather puzzled by the keeping of Sunday when God distinctly said, keep holy the Sabbath day. The word Sunday does not come anywhere in the Bible, so without knowing it, they are obeying the authority of the Catholic Church. So over and over, the Catholic Church says, if you want to see why we still have authority, why we are the boss, it's because y'all are keeping Sunday instead of Saturday, when the Bible says Saturday. That's, that's their mark of authority. That's what they say is their authority. And so, um, so it seems that at the end, you've got a commandment that's about worship and about time, and that is the Sabbath commandment. Of course, they've messed with all four of the first commandments about worship. Having no other gods before me, they put the Pope in the position of God, not making graven images, they're all over their churches, um, not taking the name, not, not blaspheming the name of the Lord. This, there's a lot of blasphemy, like saying that they can forgive sins, Take, we hold the place of God on earth, and so on, and then changing the day of worship. All of those things are there. So what is, what is the Lord doing in response to this, what they're saying, hey, this is our authority? In Revelation chapter 14, verse, beginning verse 6, we have the three angels' messages. So chapter 13 is all about the beasts and what they're doing. They're imposing this mark. They're, they're forcing the world to worship. And, they're, and so their, their mark has to do with worship and authority and then in Revelation 14, God sends these three angels with a warning 
to earth. Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth. So they're preaching the good news. The good news that Jesus died to free us from sin and to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come. We talked about judgment last time. And worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea, and the springs of water. Now, throughout Revelation, you will find that at least 25% of the words of Revelation are either quotes or allusions to some place in the Old Testament. This is one of those. Worship him who made heaven, earth, the sea, and the springs of water. If you look at the fourth commandment, it's almost identical. It's heaven and earth and sea, and then all that is in them. That part has changed. In fact, there's several places in the Old Testament that have this, this same phrase, heaven and earth and sea, and then the last one is this or that, depending on its context. And they all refer to the Sabbath. And so he's saying, in the face of this power that's saying to worship, we can change God's commandments, we can change his laws, worship us, or you can't buy or sell. He's saying, don't do that. Instead, of worship the creator. The second angel follows, and, and the second angel says that Babylon has fallen, has fallen that great city because she's made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. So there's the command to worship, and there's the command to uh, the warning that this fallen system is fallen. It's no longer, it's, it may have been great at one point, but it's fallen. Sometimes something can seem fallen before it's actually fallen. Like if you have a house, and, well, I'll give you this illustration. It's a true story. The theology building at the university I went to, um, over there, yeah. The theology building in the, in the university I went to had this chapel that was like an A-frame with a wall in the front, so it was like a triangle A-frame. And one day... One day they were having class in there and somebody bumped against the wall and the wall just went swinging out. And that ended class very abruptly. <laughs> they got out of there. What they found is that termites had eaten the entire base of this thing out. So just the pressure of somebody tapping against the wall set it loose. Now, it didn't fall all the way because it, the center beam was still well attached. And so they had to, they had to reconstitute the wood. They like tons of wood putty and stuff. By the time I was there, it was fixed. Um, but you could see, before they painted it, you could see where there was wood and then there's wood filler, wood, wood filler, and all that to fill it in. Then they painted over it, and now you can't see it at all. But um, that building was fallen before it actually, before the wall started swinging, right? So the warning would be, if the, if the inspector comes and says, this building is not safe, get out. Right? That's what this angel is saying. This Babylon, it's not safe. Get out. Okay? And then the third angel's message. The third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, if anyone worships the beast in his image and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. So this last part is a warning that says, <clears throat> if you receive this beast, if you worship the beast, if you make him your master, then you also will receive in his punishment. Again, the wrath of God was never intended for people, but those who align themselves with the one it's intended for will end up having to deal with that. So if the mark of the beast is about worship, if the mark of the beast is about um, loyalty, about a fallen system, about worshiping and so on, it can't be some sort of physical tattoo or something that people impose on you because that's not worship. Notice where the, where the mark is received on the forehead or on the hand. 
Now, um, let's see. I think I got ahead of myself there. So John was a Jew. He would have understood this concept of forehead or on, or on the hand. Um, let me just look ahead here. Okay, this is the passage I'm looking for. All right, so John, John understood this concept because they would actually take this verse very literally. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 5 through 8. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And these words which I command you shall be in your heart. So God intended them to be in your heart, right? You shall teach them diligently to your children and talk to them when you sit in, the, in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. Right here. So, the, the Israelites took that very literally, at least by Jesus' day. I don't think they did this in Deuteronomy's day, but by Jesus' day, which was John's day, they took that very literally. They would actually take the law of God. Um, most scholars, including Jewish ones, think that it was, it was um, Deuteronomy. Some say it was just this passage. And they would put it in a little box and they would attach it to their heads, strap it to their heads. And then they would take another one and they would attach it to their hand. They're called phylacteries. When I was in Israel last year, in the Tel Aviv airport, there was this, um, st- there's this place with all these phylacteries out there that you could rent. I guess it's for Israelis who are coming to travel there. And they don't actually do it back at home. You could tell they were used. So I was looking at them. I thought this was kind of interesting to see. And they had, this, they had illustrations of how you do it. Because you say these certain words and you wrap the string a certain number of times around your arm. And it's tight that they wrap these things. And, um, and then the guy came up who owned the shop and he says, Are you a Jew? No. Well, this isn't for you. <laughs> I'm like, okay, I'm not wanted here. It was the only time I felt unwelcomed in Israel. But that was not a place for me. I wasn't allowed to go into the little room back behind where they did whatever they did in there. Did no, no, I didn't. Um, yeah, when, I, when he made me feel unwelcome, I thought, well, I'd probably better not, not press anything here. So um, I was about to leave Israel unscathed, and I wanted to finish it that way. Anyway, um, so, so they still do that. Um, as most Jews now only do it for religious ceremonies. They don't do it all day long. In Jesus' day, if you were a good Jew, like a Pharisee, or so, you did it all the time. It, it was just part of the way you dressed. And so this understanding, why, why did they do it on their forehead and on their hand? They understood the forehead is, is the way you think. That's where you make your choices. And actually, by the way, modern science has borne this out. Your frontal lobe is the seat of your moral and spiritual decision-making. They've actually found, and they've had instances of people where they lose their frontal lobe, and they can live just fine. But they lose all their morality. They become very perverse, bad people. Um, So that's where your thoughts come from. Then your hand. Your hand is what you do. And right hand, sorry to us left-handed people, but in the Bible, right hand is the hand of favor. Left hand is, yeah, the opposite. And so it's on your right hand, and it's on your on your forehead. In other words, the, the, the mark of the beast can either be in your choice, like you can truly believe it, or it can just be in your actions, just doing it. Because Satan doesn't really care what you believe as long as you're not following Jesus. So if he can get you to just comply, because otherwise you can't buy or sell, then that's fine with him. He'll get you to do it. So we find that this mark is a symbol. It's not something that's literally tattooed onto your forehead or on your hand, but it has to do with your thoughts or, and or your actions. Are you worshiping the beast with your thoughts, like intentionally worshiping the beast, or are you just going along with it to keep out of trouble? Ecclesiastes uh, 9 verse 10, whatever your hand finds to do, do it with your mind. That, that just talks about this concept of your hand representing your actions. Now, in contrast to the mark of the beast, which is on your forehead and on your hand, 
has to do with worship, worshiping the beast. The seal of God has to do with worshiping God. But notice the difference between it. This is Revelation 7 verse 12, or 7 verse 2 and 3. Then I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried out with a loud voice to the four angels, to whom it was granted to harm the earth and the sea, saying, Do not harm the earth and sea or the trees until we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. So the seal of God is only in your forehead, not in your hand. Because God is not just looking for people to do what he tells them to do. He's looking for people to believe in him. If you're trying to gain your salvation through doing the right things, even through keeping the commandments of God, which is a good thing to do, but if that's how you're gaining your salvation, the seal of God is not on your hand. It's not in your actions. It's only on your forehead. There's another case, Revelation 9, verse 4. They, the, uh, they were commanded not to harm the grass of the earth or any green thing or any tree, but only those who do not have the seal of, the, of God on their foreheads. So again, the seal of God is on your forehead, not on your hand. Because God is not looking for people to just slavishly follow him. He's looking for people to loyally love him. Now, your actions will follow as a result of your beliefs. But it is not your actions that create the beliefs or that create brownie points with God or whatever. There's a lot of people who try to please God by what they do. And they're trying, they're essentially trying to do the, they're trying to get the seal of God, but they're really going after the, the mark of the beast. By the way, the words seal and mark are kind of interchangeable there. Ezekiel chapter 20, verse 12 tells us about a sign of the seal of God. Moreover, I also gave them my Sabbath to be a sign between them and me that they might know that I am the Lord who sanctifies them. So the Catholic Church says the sign of their authority is Sunday worship. God says the sign that, that he's the one who sanctifies us is the Sabbath. And by the way, Ezekiel 20, um, 20 says the same thing. It says they are a sign between them and me that they may know that I am the Lord your God. So the sign that, that he is the, our God is that. So some people mistakenly say that the Sabbath is the seal of God. It's not. The Holy Spirit is the seal of God. Ephesians 1 verse 3, 13, Ephesians 4 verse 30, 2 Corinthians 1 verse 22, all those tell us that we're sealed with the Holy Spirit. But the Sabbath is a sign of, that, of the Holy Spirit being in your life. It's a sign of loyalty to God. Just like the other is a sign of loyalty to the one who says they can change the commandments of God. So it shows us, it shows us that our value is in Jesus. So um, the Sabbath is a sign of, of creation. Exodus chapter 20, verses 8 through 11, the Sabbath commandment says the reason we keep the Sabbath is because God created the earth, right? In six days and so on. Then in Deuteronomy chapter 5, it's a sign of redemption. He says you keep the Sabbath because I rescued you out of Egypt. And so Ezekiel twenty twelve says it's a sign of sanctification. So keeping Sunday in the place of Sabbath actually denies people this intrinsic moral value that God says, I'm the one who sanctifies them. In fact, the Catholic Church now teaches theistic evolution, which says that God just sort of directed the evolutionary process, but there's no special creation. It's it, in direct opposition to the Sabbath commandment and to the Word of God. And it sounds like I am getting getting locked out here. So Romans chapter 6 verse 16 says, Do you not know that whom you present yourself slaves to obey, you are that one's slaves whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness. So the final, the final um, to summarize, because we're running out of time here, the final test, the final crisis is 
Are we worshiping the beast? Or are we worshiping God? It appears from my Bible study, it appears that that final test will probably have to do with mandated worship on Sunday versus those who choose to worship on Saturday and trust God's protection. Again, we hold that with a loose hand. There could be some other worship test. And if we only focus on saying, oh, there's got to be a Sunday law passed, well, then we could miss something else, right? But that's what I think it's going to be based on what we see from what the current understanding of what is their mark of authority, what is God's sign of his mark of authority. Now, I want to make one thing clear before we don't get out of it. I'm not saying that worshiping on Sunday gives you the mark of the beast. At least not at this point. Most people who worship on Sunday are doing so as honestly and, and righteously as they know how. Um, I've worshiped with many people on Sundays, gone to churches on Sunday and stuff, and great people. Um, we're talking about a time in which this becomes a testing truth. When there's a mandate saying you have to do this in honor of the system. At that point, you're making a choice between God and, and Satan. Right now, I don't believe that somebody who worships on Sunday and doesn't even know, doesn't even understand the Bible never authorizes that. They're not rebelling against God. And again, the mark of the beast isn't, it isn't just a day, it's an attitude. The day is a symbol of that. It, the day shows you what the attitude is, but are you going to follow Jesus no matter what? Or are you going to go along with the beast, either in your thoughts or in your actions? And that is displayed through an activity, most likely which day you choose to worship on at the, at the last day. So, I would still say, this is, by the way, um, somebody who was addressing Martin Luther, back when Martin, Lu- Martin Luther was saying, Sola Scriptura, I'm, I'm only going by the Bible. And he says, if, however, the Roman church has had power to change the Sabbath of the Bible to, into Sunday and to command Sunday keeping, why should it not have this power concerning other holy days? If you omit the latter liturgical holiday, holy days and turn from the church to scriptures alone, then you must keep the Sabbath with the Jews, which has been kept from the beginning of the world. Why did Martin Luther not embrace the Seventh-day Sabbath? There's lots of indications he knew it was the right day. He was an anti-Semite. God worked through him very mightily. God works through people of a lot of faults, but he hated the Jews. And he actually set some of his hatred for the Jews actually was some of the basis for the whole Nazi thing. He wasn't a Nazi. I'm not saying that. But it, that was a, a weakness in his, in his character. And it kept him from following the commandments of God because he didn't want to be like the Jews. And it was such a clear sign of, of Judaism. So my appeal would be to you that no one has the right to change God's commandments and God's truth. And even though we're not saved by our actions, if we are a child of God, why would we be knowingly going along with something that was intended to counterfeit what God had given us, this beautiful thing that God had given us? So I choose to worship on the seventh day of the week because God blessed it. There could be all sorts of reasons, but the only one I need is that creation, God set it apart and blessed it and made it holy. So if God made it holy, only God can make it unholy, and he didn't do that. So, any questions? Let's close with prayer. Father in heaven, thank you for this warning from the scriptures that there will be challenges to our faith. But there's also the promise that you will care for your people. And so even if we we come to the place where we can't buy or sell, you will care for us. We put our trust in you 100%. And we want to live, walk that out in the way we live our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.